Hello, and welcome to the screencast seminar on banking regulation. Today, we're going to present to you the origins of the Basel Accords as well as the development of its three pillar framework. The financial ecosystem of a country plays an important role in shaping and maintaining the economic development for a nation. It mainly consists of financial markets and financial intermediates, which control the flow of funds from those who have savings to those who have a more productive use for them. Other financial players, such as governments, regulators, corporates and individuals, contribute to a highly complex financial system with different needs and interests. One of the most essential functions of the financial system is to share risk, which is mainly handled by the banking sector. To do so, banks are betting that financial players, such as individuals and companies, to whom they lend capital, will make enough money to pay back their loans. This procedure results in generating risk, therefore makes regulation indispensable. Even though there are a lot of arguments why control and supervision of banks make sense, the question remains whether and how far banks should be regulated. In order to have a broader understanding of banking regulation, we're going to have a look at the Basel Accords and the three-pillar approach. Subsequently, we're covering the journey from Basel 1 to Basel 3. The story of the Basel Accords begins in 1974. In response of the liquidation of the Cologne-based Herrschaft Bank, 10 central bank governors formed a standing committee at the Bank for International Settlements, called the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, which later became the birthplace of the Basel Accords. So what exactly happened there in Cologne? On June 26, 1974, Herrschaft Bank received a large number of payments in Deutsche Mark from different financial institutions on the back of previously executed foreign exchange transactions. In exchange for the payments, Hersha Bank was expected to deliver US dollars to these institutions in New York. Since the clearing systems in Europe closed before those located in the US, it was common practice to send the European currency to European counterparties before US counterparties would receive their payments in US dollars. Unfortunately for the sending banks in the US, Hersha Bank was declared bankrupt by the German regulator before they could receive the dollar payments. The Herrschaft collapse revealed immense deficits in regards of the control and supervision of international banking. These events prompted the establishment of the Basel Committee, which formulates supervisory standards and regulatory guidelines, and recommends statement of best practices, also known as the Basel Accords, expecting national authorities to implement them eventually. However, it is important to note that the committee's decision have no legal force, so that individual countries are not obligated to implement its decisions. So what are the Basel Accords? The Basel Accords refers to the Banking Supervision Accords, which constitutes a series of recommendations on banking and financial regulation, set forth by the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. The objective of the Basel Committee was to create prudential rules for banks with an initial focus on establishing minimum capital requirements. To do so, the BCBS has been focusing on three main tasks, exchange of information, improvements of supervisory processes, and the establishment of prudential minimum standards. To date, there have been three adjustments of the Basel regulations, referred to as Basel 1, Basel 2, and Basel 3. These agreements define the main objectives of bank capital, a measure of the degree of risk related to bank assets, the rules relating to minimum capital that must be held by a credit institution, for covering risks and analysis measures, supervision, and market discipline. The different adaptions of the Basel Accords will be introduced subsequently. The journey of the implementation of the Basel Accords starts in 1988 with the development of Basel I, which introduced a set of minimum capital requirements imposed on credit institutions. The Basel I agreement contains three layers which provide the following. First, definition of equity capital, which differentiated between core capital and supplementary capital. Thus, the global tracking of equity capital was standardized for the first time. Second, determining the risk weights of bank assets. According to their presumed credit risks, assets could be classified in one of five risk classes, starting from 0%, which is equal to zero risk, going up to 100%, which means high risk. Depending on the risk class, either 0, 10, 20, 50, or 100% of the asset's value was considered risky and likely to be impaired. The sum of these risk weights was labeled Risk Weighted Assets, RWA, from then on. Last but not least, the definition of a capital adequacy indicator, 
respectively the minimum requirements that banks had to maintain between capital and assets weighted by risk level. Depending on the calculation method, the minimum value of this indicator must at least be 8% when it expresses the total capital ratio, which is tier 1 plus tier 2 plus tier 3 divided by all risk-weighted assets. This means that banks with an international presence have to withhold capital equal to 8% of their risk-weighted assets, while a minimum of 4% has to originate from the tier 1. So what exactly is tier 1, 2, and 3 capital? Tier 1 capital is composed of core capital, which primarily consists of common stock and disclosed reserves. Broadly speaking, tier 1 capital is capital that can be depleted without placing the bank into insolvency, administration, or liquidation. Tier 2 capital is the secondary component of bank capital, which is required by regulators. It is designated as supplementary capital and is composed of items such as revaluation reserves, undisclosed reserves, hybrid instruments, and subordinated term debt. Tier 3 capital designates capital, which many banks hold in order to support certain risk classes, such as market risk, commodities risk, and foreign currency risk. This includes a greater variety of debt than Tier 1 and 2 capitals. As previously shown, the Basel 1 Accord mainly focused on appropriate risk weighing and credit risk, which was the financial industry's main risk at that time. When the first Basel Agreement was introduced in 1988, the world was a rather simple place to conduct financial transactions. However, over the next several years, as the world evolved, so did the financial sector. New institutions came to existence, while innovative products and services were introduced. Finally, the nature of financial risk started changing, and many complicated products started to circumvent some of the Basel I rules. The shortcomings of Basel I contain, among other things, incomplete coverage of risk sources, an arbitrary measure, and a lack of risk sensitivity. Since Basel I focused on the key financial risk metrics, particularly credit risks, while ignoring the need for an overall robust risk management process, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision recognized that it was time to adjust Basel I to the new financial environment. This way, Basel I was transformed into Basel II, which was first introduced in 2004. The proposed Basel II framework was mainly a reaction to the critics of the increasing inefficiency of the Basel I Accord and of the capital arbitrage opportunities that new product and service developments had facilitated. The second agreement was built up on the fundamentals of Basel I but changed the primitive capital adequacy rules into a more general risk management regime. The Basel II Accord was based on the three-pillar approach implemented through minimum capital requirements, a supervisory review process, and market discipline. The first pillar, minimum capital requirements, established that the capital adequacy ratio must be at least 8%, just like in Basel I, calculated as the ratio between the bank's equity and assets. However, this time the assets are weighted according to three risks. First, credit risks which were already covered in Basel I, this time, however, with a higher focus on risk sensitivity. The relatively simple calculation of the RWAs from the first version of Basel was either replaced by a more complex standard process of calculating the required values, or even recognized internal models. Second, market risks. Similar to the handling of credit risks, Basel II offered options to evaluate market risks with either predefined standard approaches or the use of internal models. Last but not least, operational risks. The third section within the first pillar was first introduced as operational risk in the Basel II framework. The BCBS defines operational risk as the risk of loss resulting from inadequate or failed internal processes, people, and systems, or from external events. Finally, the minimum requirements of own funds are calculated by the following formula. As shown in the formula, the calculation of the capital requirements for market and operational risk differs from the one for credit risks. Thus, the amount of equity capital for those risks are multiplied by the reciprocal value of 8%, which is 12.5, to recognize how much the reference value of the 8% quota increased. The introduction of the second pillar finally added soft requirements to banking regulation in addition to the hard requirements for minimum capital. In doing so, the second pillar did not only address financial institutions, but also national regulators focusing on four principles. 
First, internal performance assessment procedures of its own equity and implementation of strategy to maintain it. Second, the supervisory authority is responsible for the assessment mode conducted by the banks. If necessary, the regulating institutions must take adequate actions. Third, the bank supervision can expect banks to fulfill capital requirements that lie above the minimum standard. Last but not least, rapid intervention by the supervisory authority to prevent the decline in capital. The third pillar represents the logical complement of the first two pillars. In doing so, market discipline supplements regulation as sharing of information facilitates assessment of the bank by other market players, including investors, analysts, customers, other banks, and rating agencies. It requires financial institutions to comply with more detailed reporting requirements regarding the ownership structure, risk exposures, risk assessment processes, and capital adequacy to the risk profile. This increased level of transparency ought to help market participants to have a sufficient understanding of a bank's activity, and thus identify negative developments more quickly, so that the market can aim disciplinary actions at institutions without the interference of a regulatory authority. This three-pillar approach was expected to make the financial sector a more stable and secure place. However, subsequently, there were drastic changes in the global financial environment, which led to the financial crisis of 2008 just a few years after the implementation of Basel II. The 2008 financial crisis happened the worst economic disaster since the Great Depression of the 1930s. So what happened there in 2008 and what kind of implications could be drawn afterwards for the Basel Accords? In 2007, it began with a crisis in the subprime mortgage market in the United States and developed into a full-blown international banking crisis with the collapse of the investment bank Lehman Brothers on September 15, 2008. The preceding factor for the 2008 financial crisis was a high default rate in the United States subprime home mortgage sector, the bursting of the subprime bubble. Among many more, causes for this bubble were identified in low interest rates, which encouraged mortgage lending, lax regulation allowed predatory lending in the private sector, and the Community Reinvestment Act, a U.S. federal law designed to help low- and moderate-income Americans get mortgage loans, which encouraged banks to grant mortgages to higher-risk families. The high mortgage approval rates led to a large pool of home buyers, which drove up housing prices. This bubble would finally be burst due to increasing mortgage delinquency rates beginning in August 2006. The high delinquency rates led to a rapid devaluation of financial instruments, like mortgage-backed securities, including bundled loan portfolios, derivatives, and credit default swaps. As the value of these assets plummeted, the market for these securities evaporated and banks that heavily invested in these assets began to experience a liquidity crisis. Finally, the investment bank Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy, while other institutions such as Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae had to be taken over by the federal government. The financial crisis of 2007 and 8 did not only reveal the vulnerability of the banking sector, but also the severe shortcomings of Basel II. In a 2009 release paper, also known as Basel 2.5, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision revised the current norms and attempted to react to the apparent flaws of Basel II, especially in regards of the process of securization. During the financial crisis, this process was used by banks to bundle up their chunks of prime mortgages in bonds, thus enabling themselves to outsource the risk. Other institutions used those bonds and repeated this process again, resulting in the concealment of the junk subprime mortgages with AAA ratings. To address these issues adequately, Basel 2.5 implemented modifications and adjustments of all three pillars. The changes can be narrowed down to four main features. The introduction of the incremental risk charge, which is an estimate of default and credit migration risk of unsecuritized credit products in the trading book. Credit migration risk is when a customer moves his loan from one bank to another bank. Furthermore, the IRC model also captures recovery risk and assumes that average recoveries are lower when default rates are higher. The second feature was the introduction of an additional charge for comprehensive risk measure. This was introduced to adequately measure how one risk related to other risks. Often, the increase of one risk also leads to an increase in another risk. Thirdly, Basel 2.5 introduced stressed value at risk as an additional requirement to calculate capital requirements. The concept 
of SVAR was that under stressed conditions, financial institutions may require more capital and such capital requirements are not fully covered by normal value at risk calculations. Last but not least, the modification of Basel II introduced charges for securization and resecurization positions, since the popularity of these instruments played a significant role in the 2008 financial crisis. In the end, Basel 2.5 was just a quick response to the disastrous events in the financial world. However, it was obvious that this was not enough to prevent the system from getting pulled into another financial disaster. The 2008 financial crisis outlined the additional systematic risk that the failure of one large institution could cause the failure of one or more of its counterparties, which could then trigger a chain reaction. At this point, just within weeks of the Lehman Brothers collapse and the pressure from the G20 countries, the Basel Committee began to work on a new accord, Basel III. In December 2010, Basel III was released as the third and latest version of the Basel Accords. It is a global regulatory framework set by the BCBS on capital adequacy, including new leverage ratio and capital buffers, market liquidity risk with new short-term and long-term liquidity ratios, and stress testing focusing on stability. Basel III was intended to strengthen bank capital requirements by increasing bank liquidity and decreasing bank leverage. As previously mentioned, the key principles of the latest version of the Basel Accords refer to enhancements in minimum capital and liquidity requirements and the introduction of a leverage ratio. In regards of capital requirements, the following measures and capital buffers have been introduced to specially strengthen the first pillar. Higher Common Equity Tier 1, also known as CET1, manifests an increase from 2% to 4.5% of common equity of risk-weighted assets. Since 2015, a minimum CET1 ratio has to be maintained at all times by the bank. The ratio is calculated by CET1 divided by all the risk weight assets, which must be higher than 4.5%. The capital conversion buffer is designed to absorb losses during times of economic and or financial stress. Financial institutions are required to withhold a capital conversion buffer of 2.5%, bringing the total common equity requirement to 7%. 4.5% from the common equity requirement and 2.5% from the capital conversion buffer. The countercyclical capital buffer is a buffer allowing regulatory authorities to require up to an additional 2.5% during periods of high credit growth. The minimum total capital ratio remains at 8%. However, the addition of the capital conversion buffer leads to an increase in the total amount of capital a financial institution has to withhold to 10.5% of risk-weighted assets. 8.5% must be Tier 1 capital, whereas Tier 2 capital is harmonized and Tier 3 capital is abolished. The Basel Committee has also introduced new global liquidity standards, manifested by the short-term liquidity coverage ratio, LCR, and the longer-term net stable funding ratio. These standards have been introduced to ensure that banks have sufficient liquid assets to survive acute and longer-term stress scenarios. To do so, banks have to raise high-quality liquid assets represented by the LCR and acquire more stable sources of funding represented by the NSFR, making sure that they are in agreement with the principles of liquidity risk management. The LCR is calculated by high-quality liquid assets divided by the total net liquidity outflows over 30 days, whereas the NSFR is determined by the available amount of stable funding divided by the required amount of stable funding. In addition to modifications of the capital and liquidity requirements, Basel III introduced a non-risk-weighted leverage ratio to prevent banks building up excessive on- and off-balance sheet leverage. In doing so, banks were expected to maintain a leverage ratio in excess of 3%. It is calculated by dividing Tier 1 capital by the bank's average total consolidated assets. In 2013, the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank announced that the minimum Basel III leverage ratio would be 6% for eight systematically important financial institutions and 5% for their bank holding companies. As we could see, Basel III implemented and added some significant enhancements to the three-pillar framework of Basel II. It is poised to have a significant impact on the world's financial systems and economies. Let's have a quick summarizing look at the main improvements from Basel III over Basel II. Today, in Basel III, we have enhanced transparency, consistency, and quality of capital base. We do have a risk coverage, 
We have enhanced liquidity standards, including LCR and NSFR. And we do have a leverage ratio introduced as a risk invariant measure of balance sheet growth. As previously outlined, Basel III represents a significant milestone in the development of uniform capital requirements. Its focus on the quality and quantity of core capital is the framework's very cornerstone. Moreover, in the attempt to correct the flaws of Basel I and II, the Basel Committee has designed a regime that incorporates liquidity requirements, as well as a number of macroprudential tools directed at the reduction of systematic risk. However, none of these regulations are expected to be implemented inexpensively. That's why, over the next several years, regulatory authorities must necessarily weigh Basel III's costs and benefits at each state of the new regime's implementation. Simultaneously, banks around the world must alter their business models to varying degrees in order to thrive on the Basel III. After gaining detailed insights into the Basel framework, it is time to highlight the most essential features of the different Basel Accords. Let's have a final look at the journey from Basel I to Basel III. What were the most important characteristics? The journey starts in 1974 with the liquidation of the German Herstatt Bank, which led to the establishment of the Basel Committee of Banking Supervision and the need for financial regulation. In 1988, the Basel Committee published its first version of the Basel Accords, Basel I. Basel I's emphasis was on rather simple financial risk metrics and therefore included the definition of equity capital and a capital adequacy indicator, as well as the determination of risk-weighted assets according to the presumed credit risk. However, over the next several years, the financial world evolved, becoming a much more complex sector with new institutions, more sophisticated products, and innovative business models. The Basel Committee recognized the quickly changing financial environment and started working on a new version of the Basel Accords, which was first introduced in 2004 as Basel II. Basel II introduced the three-pillar framework for the first time. The three pillars covered minimum capital requirements. Here, the capital adequacy ratio must be at least 8%, just like in Basel I. However, this time more risk categories were considered, such as credit risks, market risk, and operational risks. The second pillar, supervisory review process, gave regulators better tools over those previously available and provided the framework for national regulatory bodies to deal with various types of risks, including systematic risks, liquidity risks, and legal risks. The last pillar, market discipline, aims to complement the minimum capital requirements and supervisory review process by developing a set of disclosure requirements which will allow the market participants to evaluate the capital adequacy of an institution. These requirements involve inter alia regular publication of information every six months by national banks and quarterly by international active banks. Despite the birth of the three-pillar approach, Basel II could not prevent the 2007 financial crisis from happening. Therefore, the Basel Committee attempted to come up with a quick solution, a review of the Basel II framework, also known as Basel 2.5. This updated version mainly focused on the introduction of the incremental risk charge, which estimated the default and credit migration risk of unsecuritized credit products, an additional charge for a comprehensive risk measure, which adequately measures how one risk relates to other risks, a stressed value at risk as an additional requirement to calculate capital requirements, and an additional charge for securization and resecurization. Despite this rather quick solution, the Basel Committee recognized that it was time for a holistic approach to prevent the financial sector from collapsing again and again. Finally, Basel III was released in 2010. The latest version of the Basel Accords implemented significant enhancements within the Basel frameworks. The first pillar was strengthened by enhanced capital requirements such as the increase in common equity tier 1 from 2% to 4.5% of risk weight assets, and the introduction of capital buffers which additionally contributed to the total common equity. Furthermore, a non-risk-weighted leverage ratio was introduced to prevent banks building up excessive on- and off-balance sheet leverage by maintaining the leverage ratio in excess of 3%. Last but not least, new global liquidity standards played a major role in the Basel III framework. Those standards include the short-term liquidity coverage ratio, LCR, and a longer-term net stable funding ratio designed to ensure that banks have sufficient liquid assets to survive acute and longer-term stress scenarios.
As we could see, just like the financial world, did the Basel Accords evolve from a rather simple approach to a holistic regulation framework. However, this does not mean that the Basel journey is over yet. Its critics have found their voice, attempting to uncover potential flaws. The Basel story remains exciting. Thank you.